and salutations to all my listeners. This is Pamela Tartar, and you're listening to Factor 9 on Pure Momentum Network. Now, I've explained the name of my show before, but I'm going to use it a little bit today. Factor means element sometimes. Elements needed to reach a result. And today, I'm one element, and my special guest is Kara St. Louis, and she is one element. And then all of you listeners are also elements. And what are we trying to do with these elements? We're trying to reach a result. And that result is going to be talked about in the next word, which is nine. The name of the show is Factor Nine. Nine is the number that tells us we're at the end of a cycle. Now, why do we need to know we're at the end of a cycle? Well, we need to know because there's things that you need to do when you're at the end of a cycle. So you won't take any energy that's not needed or wanted from that cycle into the new cycle. So nine is the end of a cycle, and then one is the beginning. We're in a place in our world and in our humanity where we need to end this cycle we're in. And that's one of the goals that I have for this show, and this is a goal of my guest as well. And so we want to tie up the loose ends of this cycle. There are lots of things that we don't need. There's lots of things we don't want to carry into the new cycle. And those are things we're going to talk about today with my special guest. And we're also going to talk about some things that we can do to move into that cycle that's new, move into that one number, and do things differently for all humanity. So we're going to tie up some loose ends in the nine number. Factor nine is the name of my show. And then we're going to be ready for the one. I can't wait till I can announce that my new show is Factor One. Won't that be great? Okay, so the newness is coming, and we've got a lot to look forward to. Today, my special guest is Kara St. Louis. And let me tell you a few things about her so you'll know her a little bit. Kara is a native of the Four Corners area in the United States, growing up mainly in New Mexico, She has become a writer all her life and has published many articles, written screenplays, and has most recently written two novels, one of which is based very closely on both the death of her mother under mysterious circumstances and the reality of the aerosol war being waged against us. She has three grown children, and she is a Waldo Steiner teacher and now lives in London with her new husband. She is an interviewer and journalist in her own right, giving and conducting interviews all over Europe. Her new book, due out in about six months, covers social and cultural engineering and the reasons we have not thus far been able to save ourselves, but ways in which we most certainly can. Welcome so much to Factor 9. We're so happy to have you here, Kara. And um, thank please you. Please say hello to everyone. Hello, <laughs> world. I do like to say that. Hello, world. <laughs> oh, that's good. World says hello back. I can just yes. hear them. <laughs> thank you, Pamela. Thank you so much for having me on. And can I just say really quickly before we get started that yes. one of the things that I did not realize that somehow eluded me because you're doing so much on your end. Um, is that the name of your show is Factor 9, and I don't know if you're aware, but you will be in a second, but my number is 9. Really? Yes, ma'am. Well, <laughs> I, I, will get, I would tell you, I would tell you um, it's probably not a good idea to sort of just tr- start trotting out all the personal ways that the number 9 is mine <laughs> no. um, to the world, but uh, maybe some other time when we're just chatting, I'll tell you why that's true. And um, so you, you saying factor nine just told me I was in exactly the right spot. Well, good. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Well, Carrie, we're very happy to have you here. We've had a hell of a storm the last two days here in southwestern oh. Missouri. And I thought we were going to get another tornado last night. It was really bad. We just, yeah. within the hour, we've had this huge tree that fell on the roof of our house slide oh. down. And we were so grateful it didn't break any windows. 
Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know, we've got weather going on. And like okay. Dane Wigington says, no weather is natural weather these days. That's right. That's right. And interestingly enough, um, it used to be, and I think maybe sometimes still is, but it's really hard to sort all this stuff out. But it used to be that you could attribute various um, kinds of weather, weather phenomenon, particularly the more uh, aggressive power, power-filled power sorts of things like tornadoes and lightning to the um, hierarchies, the spiritual hierarchies. But but you really can't do that anymore because that, that's been taken over by uh, the military. That's been taken over by uh, psychotics worldwide. And I know that's not really where we want to start the conversation, but um, bringing up this idea of of no weather being natural anymore. It just makes my heart sad. Oh, me too, because I can remember, and and my husband David will attest to this, I can remember going out in the yard, holding my arms up and saying, I know we're relatives, and if I'm talking to the thunder and the, and the clouds and the rain and the lightning, mm-hmm. and you remember we're relatives too, and if you can pass over me, that will be great, because right. these were beings. And yes. now they're not being, they're, they're being run by a bunch of psychopaths, and they're not real. <laughs> I would like to understand better how that severing has taken place, actually, and that should be something that maybe um, <clears throat> I can look into more closely internally after, you know, some of these other things are, are taken care of. But when I was a little girl, and I, of course, I know, I, you know, I spent some years in Oklahoma because my dad's from Oklahoma, so tornadoes are nothing new to me. Right. And, um but growing up in New Mexico, they had the most amazing, phenomenal lightning storms in the desert. Yeah. And I used to just love to stand out in the desert and just watch and just just be part of the, the crackling lightning right. and the exploding thunder. And it was just really, you could feel it in your blood. Absolutely. And remember the smell from the ozone? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, it yep. was beautiful. But now I don't feel that way. And, you know, I've never been afraid of storms. But these storms that are not real, they're more yeah. machine-like, yeah. They, they, do, they don't have uh, life in them. They don't have yeah. real life. It's fake. Right. Right. And I don't want to be out around it. And uh, we were uh, waiting outside getting a pizza last night on the way home, and uh, the storm started up. And I thought, oh, I don't want to be in the car during this. I really need to get home. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when we got home, boy, it really cut loose then, and it, it looked so horrible but anyway we know they're real we know that we know that these uh they're real in the sense that it's a weather war and we we know that they're really doing it (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know because we're experiencing it listen i forgot something i want to put in here for the people all our listeners um you can follow kara on facebook kara c-a-r-a saint s-t lewis just like saint louis missouri Mm-hmm. And uh, you can also follow um, Kara's new e-magazine, Vortex, Conscious and Courageous, on Facebook. So you would spell Vortex and then put the colon there and then type in Conscious and Courageous. That's on Facebook. And uh, that e-zine is to be out the end of June, right? Yes, and that's looking completely doable. It looks like we're going to hit our target. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, you can you can go to that website on, uh, well, you can go to Facebook and look up Vortex, colon, Conscious and Courageous, and take a look at uh, when the, it's going to be up, and they'll have the address and everything where you can go. And um, Do you have a, a list of the names there that you could uh, share with us some of your contributors to this magazine? I do, and I'm really excited, Pamela, because I have had some... These are friends and, and colleagues, people I've worked with, written with, or interviewed, or have been interviewed by. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm just going to read the names, because um, if you want to know a little bit more about them, I've just about finished putting up short biographies and excerpts from some of their contributions to the magazine. The magazine's going to be very eclectic. Uh, we forbid such things as weaponized political correctness. We're going to be about telling the truth. We're going to be about, uh, yeah, we're going to be about discussion, and uh, we're, we're, we're not going to be um, playing by any rules of so-called, say, uh, traditional journalism. Those days are over, it, and that's not really a true phenomenon anyway, or uh, any kind of censorship. 
-hmm. We need to get out. We need to start telling ourselves the truth, and we're going to do that. Uh, The contributors I have are a fellow called Jack Hart. Uh, Gilad Atzman is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, and he's from Israel. He's a jazz musician. Uh, He's a world-renowned jazz musician, actually sells out the London Jazz Festival every year. And he's one of the dearest people in the world. And he writes about the Palestinians. And he writes about how wrong uh, the state and the government of Israel and their policies are regarding the the Palestinians and how they are in the world. And so you can imagine what he has to live with as an Israeli. (laughs) But But boy, he keeps going. And it's all about his heart, you know. Uh-huh. Um, and then Sophia Smallstorm, another friend of mine, and I think that you're familiar with her on your network. Are you not? Yes, she has done yes. a show here with us. Uh-huh. Yes. Well, Sophia is somebody that I came across when, it, it, you know, there's this phenomenon when you have uh, activists, particularly in the United States. This is something I've come across. They become celebrities in a way. And um, they become unreachable and almost useless to the general population at a certain point. Right. Sophia, ne- that's never happened to Sophia. Sophia is reachable. She's, ta- she's taught me more about transhumanism on an on a understandable, common language level than anybody I know. And uh, so she's contributing to the magazine, and I'm really excited about that. There's a fellow called Michael Tellinger. He's a South African. I was on a panel a, uh, um, with him in Germany. We were speaking with several other people. And he actually has a movement in South Africa called the Ubuntu Movement. It's a political movement. Yes. Um, and they should have received recently several seats in Congress. But um, the election was such that even though they were expecting somewhere between 50,000 and 200,000 votes for their party, uh, the tally at the end of the election registered 1,500. Oh. Now, they're thinking something's wrong there. Yeah. However, however, Michael isn't going to, to dwell in the negative. He is not going to stop and try to fight that out with the powers that be, so to speak. With the, uh, I call them the adversaries, and I know that you have your own, your own more accurate term for those as well. But it's a waste of his time. He's just right. going forward with the positive because he's building... So much momentum. So he's somebody that I would definitely watch. And he's going to be giving us uh, updates on the Ubuntu movement, which is based on no money and contributionism in communities. And they've started their own community in South Africa. So he's going to tell us how that's going. Great. Um, And, you know, let me add something about Michael Tellinger. He is the person that people might know by Adam's calendar. Yes, yes. Adam's calendar. He thinks it's one of the most ancient sites in uh, the continent over there. Yeah, and he's right, I'm sure. I, he probably I, is. I, I'm sort of sort of desperate to get down there and visit him and his, his partner, Louise, and, and really get a good look at what he's doing. And I have to tell you, he's probably one of the most spiritual people I've ever, ever met in my life. So if you have a chance to see him, I know he's touring Canada right now. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just working crazy nonstop right now, trying to raise funds for, for what they're doing. If you have a chance to see him or you come across him on YouTube, this is something you should just do immediately. I agree. Um, anyway, moving on. Also, there's this fellow called Jerome Putney. He's new. He lives in Switzerland, and he's got this uh, amazing insights into um, some of the ways that people are waking up via alternative methods. And I'm kind of interested to see what he puts out. You know, there's mm-hmm. these things called the ayahuasca experience and stuff like that. Right. I mean, this is, these are these are topics of conversation. It's nothing that I've it's nothing that I've touched personally because I haven't needed that. I came in sort of in a in a certain way, mm-hmm. but there are all kinds of things going on in the world, and I want to hear about it. Um, a woman called Christy Antje, who has uh, a different take on on some of the things that we're going through, the positive angles of what those may be. Uh, Maria Wheatley, who is uh, a guardian of some of the monolithic areas, sites here in England. She and her father are, her father's deceased now. His name was Dennis Wheatley, and apparently he was a really famous mystery writer. And I have to say I'm very embarrassed because I've never read him, and I had not heard of him before I met Maria. But she is a master dowser, as was her father. And they, she has amazing things to say about sacredness of water, Mm-hmm. about ley lines, Maria lines, and Mary lines, and uh, intersections of power and how these things are being affected or not affected. Um, Yashka Ramelow, he is uh, 
an herbalist and a practitioner of Chinese medicine and acupuncture here. He was one of the original five people with Neil's Yard Remedy here in Covent Garden, and he's going to be writing about health, big pharma, uh, and uh, those sorts of attacks on our physical being and what we can do about those. Um, And a fellow called Simon Ludgate. Simon Ludgate is a documentarian and a filmmaker, and he's written a couple of books, and he talks about how he became awake. And uh, he came out of the television industry to become awake. <laughs> so he had quite the he had quite the journey through, you know, through a glass window to get from one side of that to the other side of that. And he's a wonderful writer. And then I'm also going to be contributing as well. And I hope very much to have people who have something to say, perhaps yourself even, um, if you have the time, which you probably don't. <laughs> um, anybody, anybody who has something to say, please approach us. Tell us what it is you'd like to say, and uh, let's see if maybe, you know, you, you'd you like to write an article for the magazine after we get going. That would be great. That sounds so exciting and absolutely what we need to tie up the closing of this cycle and going into the new cycle. I just think it's perfect. You know, I forgot somebody, and I'm going to say it really quick yes. because there's so many of these people that I do this every time. His name is Harold Kautzvela, and he's a German scientist, but he's also a specialist in esoterics. You would love him, Pamela. Um, he, he, uh, he actually translated my book into German, and you will often see us being interviewed together in Germany. And we are actually, he's my partner co-authoring this next book with me because he understands the science of Morgellons syndrome. He understands the science of transhumanism. And he actually understands what's going on with the substance called sentient oil, which may or may not be finding its way into the consciousness of the United States at this point. Um, but it's very important that it does. It's, um, we can talk about that later. Um, okay. But, okay. Uh, That'll be fine. Well, I'm glad you added him in there. I can't wait to meet him some way. Yeah, you need to talk to him probably. <laughs> he's an amazing he's an amazing fellow and everything goes back to the esoteric nature of of the attack. Yes. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah, I do need to meet him. Now, Kara, before we move any further, I want to talk about your book, The mm-hmm. Sun Thief. Uh it is available on Amazon yes. and it's in paperback and Kindle, which is absolutely wonderful. It is. And um uh, I'd like for you to kind of tell us about your book and just take as much time as you want to tell us how it came about and and what you're trying to do with it and what you expect from this book. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yes. Uh, It's interesting, Pamela, because I personally have told this story so many times that I often... I'm often operating under the delusion that everybody knows the story, but <laughs> that's, that's not true. It's so, not, no. It's just not true. Um, okay, so here's here's the thing. This book came about based as, as a consequence of an event in my life that anybody in the entire universe would see as a horrific tragedy. Um, and it was. It was a horrific tragedy, but in my honest knowing, internal knowing, it was also meant to be. It was what was supposed to happen. So because of that, it's been, it gets easier for me to talk about and, and, uh, and I'm always fired up, you know, to make sure that the story gets out. But my mother was for most of my life, a music teacher. And then after I graduated from high school, she started working for the U S Navy as a, as a civilian, you know, she went into the civil service because, well, there are, there are two levels of the reason why, but I'm going to tell you the material reason. The material reason why is because she needed security. She was someone who had grown up, you know, during the World War II period, having been born in 1936. And, uh, and, and, and really, she was a product of the social and cultural engineering of the 20th century. And so she was very comfortable uh, working for the, as a civilian for the Navy. And the Navy, the military, the U.S. military, her generation was taught to think that it was just the best thing since sliced bread. And, and it was an honor to work for them and, and just all of those things. And as she went through 
the years working for the military, of course, she was not a she was a smart woman and capable, and uh, she was a technical editor and a technical writer at a time when that job was being invented. Now we all know we've all we all know technical writers and technical editors now, but there was a time not so long ago when that just didn't exist, and um, so that's what she did. And for the first job she had that's pertinent to the story, was working for the Navy, uh, Naval Weapons in Dahlgren, Virginia. And um, she had a fairly high security clearance there, but her job was mundane. She really didn't tell me much about it. And then she was transferred to London. She worked for the Office of Naval Research, and she was the editor of their fact sheet. And what that means is this is this is sort of the magazine that she would put together every month and the scientists would write abstracts and articles about what they were doing. And this was for their colleagues worldwide. It wasn't something that the general public would be interested in. It was very technical. And while she must not have understood everything that she came across, Pamela, she certainly under, you know, understood enough. Um, she had to edit this and make it readable. And a lot of these scientists were from Eastern Bloc countries and a fair amount of them were Operation Paperclip scientists. And they were working on things like weather manipulation, atmospheric physics, electromagnetic weapons, microwave weapons, psychology. Um, it really, it ran the gamut. This is a Navy think tank. And in the United States, the Navy is king in terms of black ops and special ops and secrets and all of those things. Most people don't realize that. Yes, they think I do. it's the N you do. I know you do because yeah. you've you've looked into this stuff. But the NSA, the CIA, all of those things, those are subordinate to the US Navy in terms of covert right. operations. And people just have to kind of get that under their under their belts. So she worked for this she worked for this outfit for a couple of years, and then she rotated back to Virginia again, where she worked for the Navy, again, uh, surface weapons. So she retired at the age of 60, moved to Hawaii, and became a, um, sub, a private uh, editor, a private uh, technical writer for companies that were trying to get work out of DARPA or the government. These were military contracts, and I think at that time... Uh, Military work in in Hawaii was worth something like eighty million or eighty million dollars a year, something like that. I mean, really, Hawaii runs on military contracts to a great extent. So, you know, the point being, she never really left the arena, and she saw a lot of things. She saw a lot of things. She never told me any of the details. However, what she did tell me one time, I remember when we were in London, I was visiting her in London, was that what she was seeing was scaring the hell out of her. Uh -oh. But she, she couldn't talk about what she was doing, and she never did, obviously. Okay, so flash forward, it's, um, she's 74 years old, and I had just brought her out to Maine because she wanted to be closer to her grandchildren. They were My oldest son was getting ready to graduate in one more year, and she knew that once they Flew the coop, flew you know the nest. That was kind of kind of going to be it. Right. She had tra she had traveled. She hadn't been around them very much. So anyway, I brought her out, and she was there just over a year. Uh, July tenth, twenty ten, and twenty ten was a big year for stuff like this. July tenth, twenty ten was just a regular old normal day. Raising my children, writing my books, living my life, being ordinary in a tiny tiny little town in Seacoast Maine. Yeah. And then July, July 11th was a Sunday, and uh, she was walking to church, which was about a block, maybe a less than a block from her house, crossing Main Street. Uh, many cars had stopped for her to cross. She walked very slowly because her hips were failing, and she was just about to the other side when a van came zooming down the street and sent her flying, wow. probably about 20 yards, and uh, every bone in her body was broken, basically, um, it was not, yeah, it was a pretty horrific situation. I got a call from the priest. It was an Episcopal church, and the priest called me and told me what had happened. And then we sort of raced to the hospital behind the ambulance. And I was with her. My children were with her uh, for a few hours until she died. And I, and I had already had instructions from her, you know, if anything like this ever happens, please just let me go. So I knew what to do Good. and uh, held her hand until she passed away. Now... What happens after that? Well, it's a horrific situation. It shook us up. It manhandled the entire town. 
But the whole time I was, I was trying to sort of get through the norm, the ordinary grief process. My gut was telling me that there was a whole lot more to this than I had seen yet. Yeah. And the thing yes. about my mom, the thing Let about me, my mom. Um, excuse me for butting in. We need to take okay. a break here, Kara. That's all right. And um, I want you to remember where you are. I'll try to help uh-huh. you remember. And this is a horrible, horrible story. And I'm so glad that you've gotten to the point that you feel that there is a reason and there's, and there's always a reason for everything. But it's hard to see when you're in the middle of the pain. Right. And uh, so I can't wait to hear the rest of the story. I want to remind everyone that the name of the book about this story is The Sun Thief. And you can get that at Amazon in paperback and Kindle. So our guest and the author of this book is Kara St. Louis. And you can find her on Facebook and follow her there. Now, we need to take a network break. It'll be just for a few moments. You've been listening to Pamela Tartar with her lovely guest, Kara St. Louis. And this is Factor 9 on Pure Momentum Network. We'll be right back. He who knows nothing is closer to the truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehoods and errors. Thomas Jefferson Welcome everyone, I'm Deborah Tavares of StopTheCrime.net and I welcome you to Stop the Crime on the Pure Momentum Network. I am committed to exposing the ongoing war being waged not only against all American people, but the entire global population by international central banking cabals and their minions. We will be talking to you about the silent weaponized systems of assaults upon the population, which will help to define what everybody knows. Something is terribly wrong. The corporate banking system has created the illusion that we have a legitimate government, and we do not. This corporate structure has gradually taken control of our country's economy, legal system, intelligence, military, scientific, and political operations. Only by understanding your reality will you be able to engage in solutions, and there are solutions. And we must engage. We must help others. We must live in right conduct and not be afraid. Visit us on the Pure Momentum Network and StopTheCrime.net. An amount necessary or sufficient to have a significant effect or to achieve a result. This is Critical Mass. Greetings, fellow organic beings on planet Earth. My name is Pamela Tartar. I host Critical Mass on Pure Momentum Network. My awareness tells me humanity is reaching a tipping point. A choice must be made. Either we choose continuing under ever-worsening tyranny, or we stand up in our humanity and create a new world of love, abundance, compassion, empathy, and all the human attributes and features. I invite you to join me as we explore who we are and find tools inside us, enabling us to stand tall and strong against the opposition. Now is the time. Pamela Tartar, Critical Mass. If you want total security, go to prison. There you're fed, clothed, given medical care, and so on. The only thing lacking is freedom. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Welcome back, everyone. From that little network break, David's done some new liners. I know you're going to enjoy them. Some of them are from uh, Frank Zappa and other wonderful, amazing people. We're back with our special guest today, Kara St. Louis, and she's in the middle of telling us about The Sun Thief, the name of her book, and why she wrote it, what what was the impetus for writing it, and she's in the middle of telling us about her mother having been hit by a car at a, at going across the street, and she was 
in her 70s. It's just horrible. And uh, do you remember where you left off, Kara? I do. I do because I have the visual in front of me. <laughs> oh, I bet you do. Yes. Oh. No, it's okay because it's, and I'll tell you why, and you'll understand this for sure um, when I'm done with the story, but it, it really is a positive story. Um, and I know it's hard for people to understand that sometimes, but this is an absolute positive story. This is someone making a contribution to the entire world, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so oh, now I've lost it. Pamela. I know, right where you were. Okay. It okay. shook up the whole town. It, it shook, shook up the, the whole family town. up. Absolutely. It shook up the absolutely. whole town. Yeah. It, absolutely. It shook up the whole town. Now, I have to tell you that uh, I think my mother knew that this is how she was going to die. I'm going to say that really briefly um, because for a couple of reasons, but not the least of which is six months before she died, she went into the local police station because she was so she was so disgusted by the fact that people didn't stop for pedestrians in this little town. So she went into the what she would call the cop shop, which is not... <laughs> uh, it's not derogatory. It's just no, what she called no. it. Right. And she said, you know, she's, to the whoever the duty officer was, you know, I realize this isn't going to do me, me any good, but I just want to let you know that people don't stop for pedestrians in this town. And I guess someone's going to have to get killed before something gets done about this. Now, what so was she, the response to that from the, the I, duty officer? I'm not sure. I don't remember what they said. Okay. I'm sure she told me because she was always doing stuff like that. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and she, she, and I'm sure she told me, but, she, and she, I'm, and I know she told me, that I know it's not going to do any good, but I just wanted to say that. And yeah. six months later, you know, um, anyway, the thing about this is I knew, I know, I know that my mother knew I was going to figure this out immediately. Mm-hmm. And she knew because of who I am and what I do that I was going to write about it. And she's been with me the whole time helping me do this. Oh, I'm sure she has. Which Absolutely. you probably know. Yeah. Um, and she is. She's with me all the time. So uh, helping me do this. So, but that didn't help in the immediate. No. Uh, in the immediate moment, you know, I had three children pain, who actually right. had to go through this as well. And and you know, it's everybody's karma and everybody's working out, working things out, in the way that it's been set up to work out, and all of those things. Anyway, um, two weeks after she was hit, I was taking my son to the doctor. My ex-husband and I were taking my son to the doctor and we were driving her car and someone tried to run us off the road into traffic. I hadn't even changed. Yeah. I hadn't even changed the license plates yet. And I'm sure that that was a message to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, At the time, my, my son said, mom, get a grip. That was, you know, that was just a coincidence. Stop it. You know? And I thought, okay, well maybe so. But those sorts of things continued to happen to me. Um, I could not get any uh, information on her death, not even from the local police department. And I actually had to have an attorney write them a letter saying, you know, she has the right to know there's this Freedom of Information Act um, and she's the sole survivor. Where's the police report? And they hemmed and hawed and I never really got one. And then finally, about November or so of that year, I got a, a, an envelope in the mail with no, re- it was hand addressed to me, no return address, and it had a very short police report in it, which was nice because it meant that someone was trying to get me some information. But is this the kind of thing that you get from the district attorney or your local police department? Right. No, it's not. I mean, someone was trying to help me out, but they couldn't afford to be identified. Now, right. this is a little old lady who got hit in the, in the, in the crosswalk on the way to church. What's the big deal? Why is, you know, what is the secret? Right. Uh, and so I'm continuing to understand that there's something more going on here. And then as we get closer to the end of the year, we get to December 31st, 2010. And this is when John Wheeler was found in a dumpster. Right. Um, wasn't he a general? He was either a colonel. No, he was a colonel. Colonel Jack Wheeler. Yeah. A very esteemed, retired West Point cadet got the Vietnam War Memorial up and running. And then I think in, in re- and I think he'd been an advisor to three presidents as well. But in retirement, he was a liaison between the Pentagon and government contractors, okay? Now, I've never maintained in any way, shape, or form that my mother knew Jack Wheeler, although it would not have surprised me if she had because of the circles she was running in. But what it did was reinforce this idea that civilians are expendable to the military. Absolutely. And one of the people, they are, and one of the people I've talked to about this is Gordon Duff, whom I write for at Veterans Today. 
not because I'm a veteran, but because he offers one of the only outlets for free speech left in the United States. And he took up this cause. He took up my mom's story and my book. And he was the, really the first person who let, helped me get this out into the U.S. Now, um, Gordon says, look, this happens all the time. Civilians are completely expendable to the military. It happens a whole lot more often than you might think. So the next day was January 1st, 2011, and this is when all the birds started dropping from the sky en masse, and the fish, hundreds of thousands of fish started washing up on the sea. And um, I became aware that this was happening all over the globe, and in fact, it's still happening, and it's actually getting worse. And it's not, it was happening and getting worse prior to Fukushima, Okay. Oh, yes, absolutely. But you know what? The, the media is so uh, bought and paid for that yeah. they, don't, they don't announce anything that they're told uh, to be quiet about. But it is exactly. happening everywhere, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. And, and it's so not what that firecrackers mean- either. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I know. Even my children listened to that and said, what? <laughs> firecrackers? No, but, but what that started me thinking about were things like microwave weapons and electromagnetic weapons. I didn't even know about HARP and chemtrails at that point. Wow. But I, do, I did know about some of the things that my mom had seen, and I started to look those things up. And one of the things that came into my head was uh, atmospheric physics and weather modification and things like that, because I had actually met one of the scientists that she worked with rather closely He was a German Operation Paperclip scientist who was working on weather modification. And in fact, I've never named him and I won't do it because I I don't have solid proof about any. This is all sort of a mountain of unbelievable circumstantial evidence. Right. But he's well over 100 years old. He's still alive. My word. I know, which I find to be a sort of an interesting sidebar phenomenon, Pamela. But it is. Anyway, it is. Well, he might know something to extend life. Well, I think there's, you know, there's a whole thing going on there about (laughs) life extension as well. This is, but you know, once you start opening that Pandora's box, all this stuff comes flying out. Right. And, and it's not, they're not hiding it. If you go looking for it, it's all there. In fact, they're rubbing our faces in it, you know, in a big way. So as I, at that point, I knew I was going to have to write the book. So I sat down and I started doing that. And it's at that point that one encounters that um, ingrained fear that we are all taught, you know, oh my gosh, there's already a woman who's died, blah, 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 blah. But you know what? The more I looked at the stuff, the more I knew that my children were going to die. If I, if we don't do something, we're dying anyway. They're killing us anyway. So what's the difference? And so I started to write the book. And then the Fukushima ha- event happened, and I knew even more clearly we're all dying anyway because they're just doing whatever they want to to us. So we're going to get this book out. And then the question became, what kind of a book does it need to be? Okay, Because when you're talking to people like myself or, or any of the Sophia Smallstorm or any of the other people who've done a lot of research in this area, you're, sit- you're preaching to the choir if you're, if you're writing a book that's that's geared toward them and they're not the ones who need to be woken up it's no. people like the person i had been before this happened to me that's the pe- the people that you're talking to and so what i decided to do was what i do best which is not fictionalize this story gather all of the information that i thought was baseline that people needed to know and make it into something that really captured their imagination little did i know that capturing that this format was going to be the biggest obstacle to my getting this heard in the United States. I also was listening to a fellow who ended up being my technical advisor on the book. His name is Mark McCandlish, and he lives in California. And um, he is technically one of the most well-versed people in chemtrails, weather modification, nanoparticles, state-of-the-art materials, aeronautical sciences. I mean, this man has just phenomenal knowledge. And he makes it so down to earth and so understandable. So I had listened to several of his uh, radio interviews online. Thank God for all of the stuff that we're all doing online, right? Right. And um, I decided to contact him and ask him. (laughs) It was the cheekiest thing in the world. I said, could you possibly just look at what I'm writing in this book? Because, see, I'm not a pilot. I don't know a lot of the things that you know. And if you could check... Just check my work and make sure, you know, that it's actually what it's supposed to be. 
And he literally went through my book as, and held my hand technically as we went through for the entire time, just out of the goodness of his heart, Pamela. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It, were it not for Mark McCamblish, this book would not exist as it, as it is. Well, bless and him. So, He's a wonderful man, and he gives great radio interviews, by the way. Uh-huh. Anyway, I'll have to get a hold of him. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so yeah, Mark, Mark worked with me, and he also knows a lot about black ops and things like that, and he could, he could let me know <clears throat> when things were going awry, what I might be able to do about it. The brakes in my van went out one day. Oh. Luckily, it wasn't in a, I wasn't in a situation where I was hurt, but it was not an accident for sure. Um, and then... To top the whole thing off, I, you know, I want to talk about what my book's about, but I want to finish by saying that uh, the last piece of circumstantial evidence for me that I was onto something, even though I didn't know what it was, was that the day I finished writing the book, which was March 31st, the day before Palm Sunday, which to me is significant, um, at about midnight, again, that's very significant, uh, my house started to burn and it burned to the ground. Now, that was about eight hours after I finished writing the book. Uh, That was on Temple Street. My house was on Temple Street. And um, my dogs were out. My cats were out. My children were safe and sound. Only one of them was home, even though he was on the floor that actually started to burn to begin with. My ex-husband got some, you know, message from the blue that he needed to go to the third floor and realized that we were on fire and got my son out and all of that. Right. And I ran back into the I ran back into the burning house to get my thumb drive out of my computer because that's where my book was. Because I, I was done that too, Kara. You better believe it because I was, <laughs> by God, not going to let that book perish, right? Um, in the fire. So, anyway, these are the things that add up that let you know that you're onto something, even though you don't know what it is, and all you really have are, is circumstantial evidence. Um, what what the book ended up being was a wonderful way to tell this story, to trace my mother's history and how she actually got to where she was and also have characters. I have a pilot in the story who flies these machines, who infiltrates the the chemtrail system from the inside. This is where Mark McCandlish came in, obviously. And many, many characters who embody the social and cultural traits that we all carry right now that allow that, that that make us people who can allow this to happen to ourselves and even in some circumstances help it to happen to the people we live with. Absolutely. This is important. Yes. And because and because I'm not I am never going to be the kind of person who does a, who who writes things that are that end up just being exercises in hand wringing, you know, oh my gosh, this is happening. What do we do now? Right. I, I can't do that. I also have an ending. I have a solution in the book. And my right. friend Harold, my friend Harold Kautzbella says we do not write fiction. He says what we write is never fiction. It's happening somewhere or it has happened or it will happen. And I think that that's probably true because a lot of the things that I wrote in the book that I thought were pieces of fiction turned out to be pieces of truth. Right. Um, right. But the half the you know, but the characters, you know, I'm in the book, obviously, my children are in the book, obviously, but um, I've been told, and I'm going to say this because I've just learned that I have to say these kinds of things. Um, the last couple of people who have reviewed the book, one was Australian and one was a fellow for Veterans Today, have called it actually one of the most important books ever written. Wow, now, that's amazing. I was pretty shocked when I when I saw that this was being written about the book. <laughs> because, Good deal. Because, you know, you just don't think in of your own work in those terms. But I have to say that because I think... What they're trying to say is that if you capture the imagination of a people, you've got them. And this is certainly something that the adver- adversaries know. Oh, Which they one, do know it because they use that all the time. And, one and reasons, you know, the yeah. repetition and whatnot. And that's why you have to keep going around and doing interviews like this so you can get the word out. And if this book, and it will, If this book will wake people up to something, one thing that they realize, oh, I didn't see that before. Look at this. Boy, isn't that something that you've done that. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. So that is done, and I'm trying to get that out. And this, this, I think, 
if I had to say it right now, I think this is something that my mom and I, if you have the cosmology that I have, my mom and I had an agreement to do this because it felt as if as I was going through the end of her life and the beginning of my new life, and basically this is a completely new life for me, um, it felt as if we both knew that this was coming and I and we uh, we both did exactly what we were supposed to do when we were supposed to do it. Mm-hmm. So no matter no matter what, you have to look at the sacrifice that she made as a contribution to trying to save us from what from a predator. I call it, I, I just always say that we have a predator, Pamela. Well, we, we do have a predator. Predated. Yes. I was talking to David last night. You've got predator and prey. Which one are you going to be? Exactly. And exactly. that's how our world is set up right now. And believe me, there are more predators out there than we know because we're so programmed. Exactly. This is another thing that I ended up having. I mean, you know, I had to figure out how to talk about this as well. And uh, in the end, I ended up coming to Europe. And I, and I, and I want to talk about that because, because what that goes to is the idea that we need to characterize the sequestering of the American population. And coming to Europe to try to get the word out about this book, because that seemed to be where there was an open avenue of communication, and then turn, being here for about six months, thinking that I was awake, <laughs> thinking that I had been slapped awake and that I was a fairly intelligent person, I realized that we are so far behind in terms of what we know or don't know in the United States about what's going on in the world, very much on purpose, and they keep us that way. They keep us right. wrapped in cotton. They keep us completely where they want us, which is mostly in the dark. And so the first six months I was here was a very steep learning curve for me. And I'm very, very glad to have that had to happen too, you see. So I came to the, I came to Europe. I started doing the things I I was doing here, learning, interviewing, and doing a little bit of traveling and a little bit of speaking. And then I could turn around and I could sort of, you know, metaphorically look back at my own country and say, oh my God, we have to bust back in there and and try to get back into the English speaking population, but primarily the United States in whatever way we can. Right. Because we are being completely managed informationally. We are being completely managed behaviorally, culturally, socially. We're in a trance all the time. That's right. That's right. But you know what? We can break this trance. And we if can. someone if someone reads your book, there might just be one thing in there that does it. And, you know, once you get a hold of one thing and you see the programming or the the propaganda or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. once you're awake to that, then it's so much easier to become conscious of the other thing. Right, right. Well, and that's the other thing. Pulling, I mean, if I can do it, anybody can, Pamela. I was just, you know, your basic, regular United States citizen. I bought into everything that they told me I needed to buy buy into. You know what I mean? And uh, you pull one string and the whole thing comes down so easily. This is why, this is why, gosh, you know, I, I, I actually say things like my country's under a spell and I mean it. Oh, it is. I mean it that way. I mean it black magic spell. I know. (laughs) Sorcery. Yeah. We, you know, think about the ways that we operate. Just put in your, put in your mind. Oh Yeah. Uh, maybe you're somebody out there listening to Pamela and you're thinking, gosh, you know what? I'm going to get that book because I think even if I don't need it, my sister does or my dad does or whatever. And then two minutes later, you'll be thinking, oh, my gosh, did I buy milk for the cereal tomorrow? And, oh, gosh, the dog's barking. I better go find. And you're, it's gone. It's out of your brain. It's That's floated right. away. And that is not an accident. That's not you. That's the electromagnetic prison that we live in in that the United States. That is true. It has absolutely interrupted our thinking processes. Yes. And it has made human beings to run programs like our computers do. Yes, exactly. the, I call them the opposition. The mm-hmm. opposition, you call them the adversaries, and that is true. That is exactly what they are. But the opposition and these adversaries know how we work. They know yes. very clearly how we work. And to interrupt our thinking processes, to turn us into running programs like our computers or machines do, 
That's mm-hmm. what's doing this. And so they can punch a button and get you to another program where you don't even get to finish your thought. You don't get to process information. Right, right. So now the thing is, we do have we do have the will to to break through that, but we have to understand what it is that's happening to us. Otherwise, and then we can do it, which is one Absolutely. of the things that they don't. You know, I wanted to. I think I mentioned to you this before, and if you'll indulge me for just a second, I want to read something briefly. Um, and and I don't know exactly how authentic it is, but it's so to the point that I'm going to go ahead and read it. This came from a fellow called Miles Johnston who has a, a radio show of his own over here in England, and he read this out. And, and I just, just briefly, it starts out, Merry Christmas, America 2013. Now, I heard this on Easter Sunday of this year, and it literally made me cry because oh. I have three children still in the United States. But I want you guys to hear this because we can comment on this. From the U.S. Navy Special Operations, disclosure on technologies and applications being used against American-targeted individuals. First, all 315 million Americans are targeted individuals. They're in an electromagnetic concentration camp under, they say unbreakable, but I don't believe this, under electronic mind control. There is a secret military police structure that silently controls much of America, especially in regards to current and future plans regarding population culling and management. On the lowest level are actual police and soldiers. As I was told, everyone who carries a holster and a badge is directly under our control. Um, It is all under NORTHCOM. Navy elements and private black ops security firms are used for much of it, especially the dirty work. It's all done by neural frequency weapons and systems running on the now thoroughly complete atmospheric topologies of HARP, ELF waves, etc., with nanobots from chemtrails and aerosols in and around the subjects. In the bigger picture, Americans and the global population are being buried alive in a frequency fence. Even the tiny handful of people who've had exposure to mind control, for example, insiders themselves or most targeted individuals, have no idea how fantastically advanced, subtle, and powerful the current system really is. It is beyond words. Anybody can be taken over within seconds and be totally remote controlled without knowing it. It's Mm. beyond the capacity of those who haven't experienced this being done to themselves and others around them to even comprehend this. And that goes on for 20 pages, but that's enough, isn't it? Oh, my word. Yes, I'd love to have the link to that if you could send me the link I will sometime. Send, I will definitely send that it. That would be great. It says, well, we talk says, about this often. We believe it. We know it. We feel that we are being attacked with frequencies. Yeah. They, call, they say all Americans are computers. All Americans are computers, and it takes an average of five minutes to access any American. Wow. That, that's how we're set up right now. Now, let me just say that if you're reacting to that particular paragraph the way I reacted to it, which was shock and sadness and just, you know, sort of tears in your eyes for the people that you love, I have to say that we are also people who can hear that and, and our higher selves are actually reading that and sort of being apart from that. So I guess what I'm trying to express when I say that is that we have the power to break that. Absolutely. Just, we just because they say it's unbreakable doesn't mean it is. That's right. That's just that's just them telling us that. Well, that's um, a word programming. It's to tell exactly. us it is. And since we're used to listening to people and uh, we we have a program running all the time that's called I call the authority figures program. When right. someone in authority says something, well, everybody just goes along with it no matter what. Exactly. But, but I, I think you it's can a, break these programs because I mm-hmm. have done it and I've taught other people to do it. Right, right. And that's important, too. It's really, really important that we help each other with this and how to break through and things like that. Um, but I wanted people to hear that because it's not the depth of this. I'm not questioning at all. Uh, I think it actually is that way. And various parts of the, uh, what I've learned is various parts of the globe are serving various functions for the adversaries. Yes. The United States, as we may or may not be aware, we're coming to be aware, some of us, that the United States is the military arm of the adversaries. We are, we are just the troops right. that they send out, um, which is very antithetical to who we are as a nation. We're not 
the kind of a nation, you would not think that we were the kind of people who would just um, accept that. But that was a hundred years in the making or more. Uh, we have been uh, we have been trained via our quote unquote education system. I call it the schooling system because it's not education. It's it's brainwashing and training to become citizens who don't argue and who think that our leaders are always telling us the truth and that we need to do whatever they say no matter what. That you know that system was invented in Prussia in 1818 and brought to the United States in the 1850s by Horace Mann under vehement protest by the citizenry. They did not want that uh, laid upon us because they saw it as brainwashing and mind control. And lo and behold, that's exactly what it turned out to be. Absolutely it is. And I just did a show uh, on uh, two of the programs that every American is running. And one of them is the Patriot Program and the other one is the Authority Figures Program. And when you put those two together, very good, sane whole good citizen people will stand up and go stand in front of a firing line and die. They will. They for will. For the bankers absolutely. because we have that program running in us. Mm-hmm. And I want to shine the light because the first step to breaking these programs is you have to see it and recognize it for what it is. Right. Right. Exactly. If, if you just, like you said, the process, uh, the thought process gets interrupted. So mm-hmm. even if you think that, oh, something's not right with this. Well, Mm -hmm. they push that other button and some authority figure comes up. Oh, goodness, my phone. I forgot to turn my phone off. Oh, my. I've never done that in a show before. That's funny. Um, (laughs) Yeah, you know, they push the button and an authority figure comes up and he says, oh, yes, if you're not with us, you're against us and all these crazy patriotic things. And then all of us that went to school, which I call them prison camp yep. preparations, yep. Um, when you, when you uh, uh, have those two programs going, mm-hmm. the, the uh, people, our young people, our good citizens, just stand up and go wherever they say. And right, that's, right. Why, that's why our military is coming home and committing suicide and going nuts. Because yeah. they know something's wrong. And yeah. what I was thinking today is the programming is starting to break down. It, it is. is. I see it. I feel it. I know it is. It is. And it every is. time you talk, every time I talk, any, every time other people talk and shine the light on this, it gives it another bump up that says, oh, yeah, something might be wrong here. Even mm-hmm. people, even people that, that don't normally look at things like this are beginning right. to be a little bit affected. Yes, I agree with you completely. And it, it's going to be an avalanche shortly. Yes. I believe that. Yes. I believe that. I mean, and here I am, I mean, talking about education, um, you know, here I am a teacher and I have a beloved pedagogy that that I, uh, that I really think, you know, needs to get out into the world. But I also have three children who went through that pedagogy and then opted for state schools. I call them state schools now because I'm in England and you can't say public school. It means something completely different here. But so I've trained myself to say state school, but they're government schools. Mm -hmm. And I've come from being someone who was and still is very proud of my oldest son for graduating in three years and going on to a top notch school and and but doing um, an art, he's gone into the arts, so it's it's a little bit different. It's a conservatory to being somebody who's really my my daughter. Uh, she's a visual artist, and when she turned seventeen, she said, "Mom, I I just want to quit." And I said, "Okay, let's quit. Get you out of there. You right. get at, come out of there, and you have your mind still, and you have your." your talent and your, and your humor and, and that wonderfulness of yourself, get out of there. I'll pull you out. No problem. And then my youngest son, I just assume they know now that I have absolutely no respect for state, uh, the state uh, pedagogy, the state curriculum. It comes out of the council of foreign relations. Now, I mean, it's, it's so uh, if my youngest son, I say to him, look, why don't you just, I know you need, feel like you need to finish up because of what you want to do. So get that certificate, get that piece of paper, maintain your mind, maintain your vision and your intellect and all of the wonderful things that you are and just get the hell out of there because I have no respect for for what they're giving you. Now, that's a pretty amazing change in me in the last three years. Good. 
Okay. But that's, I think that's a, that's a reasonable, logical end to the evidence that we've been presented with. If you're paying attention at all. And the other thing I think happened, Pamela, that I, that I want to touch on really briefly, because I think that um, we're talking about breaking free and we're talking about what's left within us as American citizens that we can, that we can use as a crowbar to get this uh, thing off our backs. Um, I was actually very proudly a, a delegate for Ron Paul for the state of Maine. Just a few weeks after my house burned down, <laughs> I felt it was, I know, we, we, I didn't even have a place to live yet, but I felt like it was really important that I do that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we tried as hard as we could, you know. And uh, when I think, when I answer the question, well, you know, what Ron Paul has to be disinformation, he has to be controlled opposition, he has to be, you know, those kinds of things, because otherwise they, they would have, somebody would have shot him a long time ago, right? But my idea about Ron Paul, and it's kind of interesting, is that they let him go to as kind of an experiment, a social experiment, to take our temperature and find out where we are in terms of our belief systems. Are, are we still hooked into the... Uh, the Constitution, are we still, and more importantly, are we still hooked into our basic um, rights, right. you know, the amendments? Are, yeah. are, how, how is that going? Are the young people responding to that? Is it still entrenched in the older folks? Things like that. And I think they found out that they still have a lot more work to do <laughs> um, in terms so. of unplugging us from who we are as Americans. And this goes to what I call the folk soul. F-O-L-K-S-O-U-L, okay? We come to a certain place to enact a certain thing. And the American folk soul is about sovereign, individual sovereignty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's very important. It is. It is. And, and, you know, the adversaries, the oppositions know this, and that's mm-hmm. why they're sending people in, um, illegal immigrants by the jillions over here, so that it will disrupt our, um, actually, our folk soul. Yes. Yes. That's absolutely what's, yeah, we, we can talk about that a little because I think that's, uh, that's very, very important. It's, uh, the dissolving of the borders. Um, yeah. you end up with things like weaponized political correctness, fracturing us into these little parts that, you right. know, you dare, that just divides us. That's it's right. An, that's it's one, an of their, that's on the, one of their main weapons. Yes. It's an attack us. on the yes. majority, right? Well, we have to take a break. Carol, okay. we're just going along so so good, but I want to invite all of our listeners to become members and join us in the members section for the second hour. Of course, Kara and I are going to have a great time, and we're going to discuss lots of things, and Kara just mentioned a few. We're going to finish talking about folk soul and what our open borders are doing to us. We might hit political correctness, uh, propaganda a little bit more. And uh, I do want to touch on the attack on the family and the war on masculinity. I just did, on my Critical Mass show, I just did a show on uh, the attack on women's very nature. And I'm preparing a show right now on men's, uh, um, the war on uh, masculinity. So we might touch that a little bit. We sure have enjoyed you being with us, Kara. Thank you for your time and your presence. And I can't wait to get into the second hour. Now... Um, I want everyone to know that they can get your book, The Sun Thief, at Amazon in paperback and Kindle. They can follow you on Facebook. And to look for your new magazine, your e-magazine, Vortex. And uh, it is on uh, Facebook. And you can find out when it's going to be and where it's going to be if you type in Vortex colon Conscious and Courageous. So this is Pamela Tartar with my special guest, Kara St. Louis. You're listening to Factor 9 on Pure Momentum Network, and we're heading into the second hour. Come join us. We invite all our listeners to join us in the members section for the second hour of all our shows. We encourage you to click on the subscribe button, choose a membership type, pay with PayPal, and voila, you're a member. Enjoy all Pure Momentum Network material, the second hour of all talk shows, extra interviews, 